Have you ever had one of those days where you're just like, people are the worst kind of people? <laughs> I had one of those. It was at uh, a friend's Hanukkah party of mine. Uh, the music's playing over here, the drinks are over there, and well, the drinks are over there, so that's where I am. <laughs> and I, I'm there and there's this Jew bro sort of walks up to me. And, and when I say Jew bro, you, you kind of know the type, like with like the, the frosted tips and the hair and like these huge golden Magen Davids where they, they look like they'd be an extra on something like Jerusalem Shore or something. So. <laughs> So anyway, Jubro comes over to me, he's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, hey. And he's like, so are you really Jewish or are you just playing it around? And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> am, I, am I really Jewish or just playing around? Are there, are there people that do that? <laughs> like, is there just like a flock of black people somewhere going, you know, I'm, I, just, I just don't feel oppressed enough. Like, <laughs> I, I just feel like playing around with something that, that, that'll make me black with more black added on. Like I just, I have this craving for food made by people who were absent the day they gave out spices during the Crusades. And they think seasoning is just adding onions and black pepper is spicy. Like, are there, are there black people out there like that? Because if there are, if you know any, like introduce me to them because I, I'd like to know why they're making my life so hard. Because they're probably the reason why when I go into a Judaica shop to pick up a Seder plate, the salesperson comes over to explain to me that I'm picking up a Seder plate, which, whew, bullet dodge there, because I almost, I almost walked out of here and thought it was obviously a six-person ashtray, so. Whew, embarrassing. So. And then there's, there's always sort of that, that hyper-rational person that's like, well, you know, a teachable moment's opportunity, and just, just, no. No, I don't, I don't believe in teachable moments and opportunities at my expense. Um, but I very much do believe in demanding that my Jewish be able to enter Jewish spaces and Jewish events just as unassailed as every other Jewish in the room gets to. Yeah, it's just... Uh, common courtesy, I'd like to say. Because in that moment, when, when I heard that, you know, are you really Jewish or not? It, I wasn't even maybe upset or, or shocked or anything. It, it more felt like I was walking through my own house and all of a sudden a pair of gates was just slammed in my face. Now, I also get that people aren't necessarily being like intentionally malevolent. You know, they're, there's probably somebody out now thinking, well, yeah, that guy was really a jerk, and you know, I'm sorry that you had to like, go through that. And, and no offense, but to be respectful, you're Jewish, yes, but you know, you're also black. And you don't, you don't really get how the trauma of the Holocaust affected Ashkenazi Jewry. How, how one day these people were our, our, our neighbors and our, our coworkers, our students, and the, the next day, they were our executioners. How it made us feel abandoned and worthless. How we learned to be mistrustful and, and even aggressive towards outsiders and mistrustful of people who we didn't recognize. And I get that. I can, I can empathize with that. After all, I'm from a population that knows what it's like to have a captor and an owner one day and a neighbor and a landlord the next. And then to have to continue living with those people as they consistently denied your humanity for the next at least 98 years. So I can understand that. And sure, there are certain times where being inquisitive for a specific purpose is completely reasonable. And I'll repeat that. There are times when being inquisitive for a specific reason is completely reasonable for marriage, for getting called up to the Torah, for finding out where a really good bagel shop is. <laughs> but generally speaking, you should probably just assume the same thing that you assume if I were addressed and acting identically to how I am now, but just doing it in a different color skin. But yes, 
I do understand and I hear and I empathize with that trauma that comes from the Holocaust, a trauma that's affected generations of Jews that have never even seen the Holocaust. But you know what else is traumatic? When, say, you're the 15th generation descendant of the Tosfot Yom Tov, the 17th century chief rabbi of Prague, when your great-grandmother and great-uncle were on the voyage of the damned, when your grandfather was kicked out of gymnasium for being Jewish, when your grandmother was part of kinder transport, when you are the president of the Hillel at your college. And as you're walking into the event that you yourself has organized, you get gates slammed in your face. Because your African-American father made you slightly too dark to look Jewish. You can't come in here, you're told. This is a Jewish event. It's not my story, it's my wife's story. And I'll be damned if it's my daughter's. And yes, questions have always been essential to Jewish continuity and survival. The Seder, at 1,500 years old, is the oldest currently practiced ritual of the human race. And it is predicated on the asking of questions on curiosity, which is very much encouraged in Judaism. Which are in concepts, rituals, objects. But what does Jewish tradition say about curiosity when it comes to people? Miriam, Moshe's older sister, really curious about the marital life of her brother, asks Aaron, well, why is being a prophet, meaning he's separating from his wife. Didn't God speak to all of us? Yes, aren't we all prophets? Her reward, immediate leprosy. Rabbi Eleazar of the Talmud, he's going from town to town and he happens across a man in the road. He says to him, curious, is everyone from your town as ugly as you are? <laughs> the man says, I don't know. Why don't you ask the craftsman, i.e. God, Ask the craftsman about this ugly vessel that he's made. And Rabbi Eliezer realizes immediately that his curiosity was wrong. And then we have the saga of Rabbi Yehuda and the Aramean. A very controversial story, as within it, the Aramean comes to Rabbi Yehuda to boast that every year in Jerusalem, he eats of the Passover offering. This is, again, quite controversial, because the Passover offering in Jerusalem is only supposed to be eaten by Jews, not non-Jews or the uncircumcised. So with witty rabbinical machinations, Rabbi Yehuda sets things right and outs the Aramean. But the premise of this story is a very large, glaring question there. How was the Aramean able to get away with it in the first place? Well, Maybe because when he entered a Jewish space for ostensibly a Jewish reason, probably dressed like a Jew, everyone assumed, oh, you must be a Jew. No third degree ne necessary. Now you might think, see, this is exactly why we need to ask, why we need to see people who we don't recognize or don't look Jewish, because this can happen. And that would seem to make sense, except it's absolutely wrong. Because this episode is the source of the halakhic rule that when someone says that they're Jewish, we do not investigate them. Because true Judaism has always been about openness when it comes to people. The four species of the holiday of Sukkot, citron, myrtle, willow, palm, they all represent four different Jews of varying knowledge bases and levels of virtue and how they're all necessary for us to have a healthy Judaism. On Tu B'Av, the Jewish holiday of love, the daughters of Israel would borrow dresses from one another so that they would all equally enter the space unembarrassed and equally unquestioned as to this one's financial status or this one's social grace. The Seder, it's opening nines. Whoever is hungry, let them come and eat. Whoever is needy, let them come and celebrate. That's my Judaism. That's the Judaism I know. And that doesn't really sound like a particularly suspicious religion to me. Actually, there is this, this one thing. Um, in ancient Israel, uh, when you killed somebody, the first thing you did was run to a city of refuge. Now, you would stay there to be safe from the recriminations of your victim's blood rel relatives, and you'd wait there for trial. And if you were found to be actually guilty, you'd be put to death. 
However, if you were innocent of intentionally murdering somebody, you still had somebody's death on your hands. And so you returned to the Sea of Refuge to live in exile. But way back at that first step, when you killed somebody and you ran to the nearest city of refuge, you were first stopped at those gates again. They asked you who you were, why you were there, what you did. And then after you answered those questions, they let you in. In our post-Holocaust ideology, we treat Judaism as a city of refuge. Some place that we stop people at the gates and ask them who they are. How did they get there? Why are they there? But the city of refuge was never a sanctuary. It's not a safe space. It's a place of expiation. You're in a city of refuge because you did something wrong. And that speaks volumes of our relationship with Judaism. There are too many Jews that are getting stopped at the gates and not being left alone to be their Jewish in Jewish spaces. Jews of different observance levels, LGBTQI Jews, Jews by choice, and in my life experience, Jews of color. We're creating this negative Judaism that's obsessed with how to keep people out and not so much focused on how to welcome them in. But it's not too late to change that. We know how to do it. We have a blueprint of millennia of Jewish tradition. It looks like welcoming in people who are hungry and needy for community and feeding them with welcome in our communities. It looks like borrowing each other's clothes and considering what it's like to walk in each other's shoes. It looks like us realizing and remembering that we all have different knowledge bases and virtue levels and that we all need to work together to have that healthy Judaism. It's about remembering that even though, yes, the Jewish people was one people, it was made up of 12 distinct, unique tribal identities and expressions that nonetheless formed one cohesive whole. For me, it looked like walking into this random synagogue in the city that I'd never been to, um, hearing a rabbi give a sermon who I've never met before, and walking in as he's condemning police brutality and lecturing to his congregants about Black Lives Mattering, about my life mattering, to a room of Jews who not a one looked like me, and all of them agreeing that my Jewish equally deserve to exist in our same city with the same safety and protection as their Jewish did. So, true bro, am I really Jewish or just playing around? I'm pretty sure you can figure that out by now. In the meantime, I'm kind of late to my own party. I've, I've got this six person ashtray that I'm dying to try out. 